All right. Uh, well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Casey Ross. I'm the National Health Technology Writer for Stat News. Uh, I cover the people and companies who are using technology to upend traditional business models in biopharma and in medicine. Our topic today is disruption. Uh, the usual way of doing business in, in healthcare is changing dramatically as incentives for research and care shift uh, and technology creates new opportunities. We're going to talk about how roles of hospitals and universities are changing and how they're engaging with entrepreneurs and investors under these new models. Uh, hopefully, we'll give you a clear sense of where, uh, innovation, uh, of where innovation is headed in all the different realms we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I want to uh, start off by introducing you know, the panelists who are going to be uh, joining us for the discussion. I'll start with uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey. Uh, he's the David M. Levy Professor of Neurology and Director of the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Through novel applications of technology, he and his colleagues seek to enable anyone anywhere to receive care, participate in research, and benefit from therapeutic advances. Dr. Dorsey previously directed the Movement Disorders Division in Neurology Telemedicine at Johns Hopkins, has worked as a consultant for McKinsey and Company. His research has been published in leading medical, neurology, and economic journals, and he's been featured on NPR, in the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, in 2015, he was recognized as White House Champion for Change for his work in Parkinson's disease. Ray, I wondered if you could sort of introduce us to what you're doing in your realm by talking about how technology is uh, advancing care and improving access and, and how you're applying these technologies sure, at your institution. A, we'll start with a question. How many have a friend or family member with Parkinson's disease? So just take a look around. So uh, neurological disorders are now the leading source of disability in the world, and the fastest growing neurological disorder in the world is not Alzheimer's disease or stroke, but it's Parkinson's disease. From 1990 to 2015, the number of people with Parkinson's disease uh, more than doubled globally. In the coming 25 years, it'll double again. So among the many challenges that faces is that a lot of people are not receiving the care that they, that they need. Only about 40% of Medicare beneficiaries with Parkinson's disease see a neurologist and those that don't have worse health outcomes and are more likely to die. Um, so rather than asking older individuals to come see me on my terms, uh, we, for the last 10 years, have been seeing patients directly in their home using video conferencing. So much like Skype, uh, except we use HIPAA compliant uh, video conferencing software, and we see patients uh, directly in their homes uh, with grant support from the Greater Rochester Health Foundation and another foundation called the Saffer Foundation. We care now for over 300 New Yorkers from Long Island to Lockport, New York. Uh, with Parkinson's disease by seeing them directly in their homes. Uh, the average age of our participants is over 70. 59% uh, live in health, health professional shortage areas. 20% are homebound. And our satisfaction rates are about 98%. Uh, and to my left is Dan Lillianquist. Am I saying that right? There you are. Got it. OK. He's a senior vice president and chief strategy officer for Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, he's responsible for helping Intermountain's executive leadership team set and achieve its strategic priorities. Prior to joining Intermountain in 2012, Dan served in the Utah State Senate, was nationally recognized for his work on Medicaid and public sector pension reform. He's a former strategy consultant with Bain & Company. Uh, Dan is the lead architect and uh, board chair of Civica RX, an initiative to create a not-for-profit generic drug company to ensure that essential generic medications are avail available and affordable to everyone. Uh, Dan, I wondered if you could start us off by talking about the conditions in the generic drug market that drove you to create Civica and, and what kind of interest uh, and buy-in has it gotten from healthcare providers? Yeah, so if you go into a hospital system around the country, uh, it's almost universal. We're managing close to 200 shortages of essential generic medications. Medications have been on the market for decades that are really kind of the foundational drugs of modern healthcare. And uh, as we started looking into, you know, why if you have very stable demand, and very stable demand, we, we, you could predict exactly what these hospitals, what Intermountain would use and, and uh, hospital systems around the country would need to have each of these drugs. Why do we have a broken supply chain? Um, and what you know, we found out is essentially over the last decade or so, there's been a tremendous shakeout of the generic drug market to, and of these nearly 200 drugs that were managing shortages, there's, there's one dominant player uh, market by market. And um, as we looked into the economics, really, it's really economically driven 
uh, model with, again, high fixed cost of entry per drug, low marginal cost of production. It really has led to essentially a sole source market in many of these markets. And one of the hallmarks of a monopoly situation, the reason why monopolies are considered market failures is because the way a monopolist maximizes its profits is by restraining supply. And, uh, and so you've seen you know, a significant degra degradation of the uh, predictability of the supply of these drugs, and we rely on these drugs every day. So as we thought about this, we thought, you know, how do we fix this? This is untenable for, you know, again, a first world country um, and for these health systems who rely on these drugs every day, how do we fix this? And essentially, we, we, you know, we realized that the only way to really fix this is through a collective vertical integration into generic drug manufacturing. And um, so we were kicking around this idea at Intermountain Healthcare, and uh, I got to know Mike Levitt in my service in the Utah State Senate and mentioned this to him, and he made some connections with other health systems, and we came forward with this idea. So we've organized Civica Rx as a Delaware non-stock nonprofit corporation that is essentially designed to be a public utility model for the manufacture and distribution of essential generic medications. And we're pre-contracting with hospital systems to make sure on a take or pay arrangement to make sure that we stabilize and have predictable demand so we can build to that demand. And then one by one, we hope to stabilize the, um, the market for these essential generic medications and if need be, be the producer of last resort, manufacturer of last resort in these, these markets. And so far, it's gone extremely well. We announced on September 6th that we have um, 10 governing members um, um, in our organization, three large philanthropies, and seven major health systems. Um, to be totally honest, Intermountain Healthcare, um, had we not been driving it, we weren't big enough to be even in the room with some of these players. We've got really a lot of the large players with us, and um, our model is one that we want everybody with us. Um, the investor-owned hospitals, not-for-profit systems, everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we're now contracting with hospital systems around the country to join us in this effort. And Dr. Andrea Feinberg is the Chief Health Officer at Geisinger Innovation, one of the nation's largest healthcare organizations known for innovation in medical care. As a trained internist, pulmonary, and critical care specialist, she uses lifestyle medicine to improve the health of patients, uh, members, and employees. She was instrumental in launching Geisinger's Fresh Food Pharmacy, a pioneering initiative that uses food as medicine, a food as medicine approach to treat t type 2 diabetes. Uh, Dr. Feinberg designed the program which educates patient, patients about the cause of diabetes and provides tools to reverse the disease through education and lifestyle changes. Prior to Geisinger, she was an assistant professor of medicine at UCLA's David Geffen School of Medicine. Andrea, I wonder if you could talk about how you're using food to change the way healthcare is delivered and what kind of outcomes have you seen for patients who have used uh, fresh food pharmacy? I'd be happy to. So. Um let me start off by asking, who here knows how, uh, someone who's overweight or obese? <laughs> so I had no idea how many people had neurologic diseases and Parkinson's. We know in the United States, two thirds of America is overweight or obese. There are many people, millions of people who are pre-diabetic and don't know it, and one out of 10 currently have diabetes in America. When I was born, one in 100 had diabetes. So we have an epidemic now of diabetes, and for someone born today, one in three will develop diabetes. 90% of people who have diabetes have type two diabetes, and that's a lifestyle condition. And lifestyle diseases are the ones that I saw for 20 years in the ICU when I was taking care of them. These are diseases that you know as hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and um, peripheral vascular disease and cerebral vascular disease. These things occur because of things we do in our everyday life. And so if you smoke, if you don't exercise, if you don't eat well, you tend to develop these conditions. We know at Geisinger that um, being an integrated healthcare system, that it's very important that we focus on our populations in our communities, and we see a rise in obesity, a rise in prediabetes and diabetes. And we also have been seeing a rise in our communities of food insecurity. And so we don't, in medical school, we never really talked about this 20 years ago, but what we understand now is that everything that we do as physicians in the hospitals, the nurses, the dietitians, we only improve health outcomes by about 20%. 
We, and about 70% of a person's health outcomes relate to their daily life activities, and about 40% relates to what we call social determinants of health. It's actually a very bad term, but it's unmet social needs. So perhaps to explain this to everyone here, um, unmet social needs and social determinants are the things that we do in our everyday life. So do we have food? Do we have transportation, housing, and so <laughs> forth? What we recognize at Geisinger is that if someone doesn't have enough money to buy healthy, safe, nutritious food, it doesn't matter what the dietitian, doctor, endocrinologist tells them to do for their diabetes. There's no way they can be, quote unquote, compliant with their care. So we set out in 2016 to pilot a program of patients who had type 2 diabetes and were food insecure. And we did something very novel. We gave them free, safe, nutritious food, no charge. And we hooked them. We got them in. We were giving them food every week for themselves and their entire household. And along the way, we taught them about their disease. We pro provided 20 hours of education, and the patients got dramatically better. Actually, I'm a critical care doc. Within a week, people developed hypoglycemia. That's very dangerous. It's a very bad thing, shouldn't happen. So we learned very quickly that just by changing someone's diet, you can dramatically improve their disease control. We saw within six to 12 weeks that we could change behaviors, change lifestyles, and we saw significant drops in their blood sugars and a blood test called a hemoglobin A1C, which reflects six to 12 weeks of blood sugar control. So we were very excited, and we've since then rolled out the program, and we're currently providing about half a million meals a year, and by the end of 2019, hope to be providing at Geisinger 1.5 million meals for our patients that are food insecure and have diabetes out of control. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joel Dudley is currently Associate Professor of Genetic and Genomic Sciences and Founding Director of the Institute for Next Generation Healthcare at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. In March 2018, Dr. Dudley was named Executive Vice President for Precision Health for Mount Sinai Health System. In 2017, he was awarded an endowed professorship by Mount Sinai in biomedical data science. Pri prior to Mount Sinai, he was a consulting uh, professor of systems medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine. Joel, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, how uh, artificial intelligence is being used to harness the vast amount of genomic data that is available now uh, to achieve the underlying goals of precision medicine. You know, how are you using this technology and, and this knowledge and practice at Mount Sinai? Yeah, so nobody's using artificial intelligence really in precision medicine at the, at the genomic level right now. Mm -hmm. They're mostly using it for research and development. A lot of the applications of artificial intelligence you see in the healthcare realm are largely around imaging, you know, analysis of imaging. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense because the heritage of deep learning was an image and video analysis, right? So, and we've done some stuff with deep learning uh, and EHRs as well. But the one, one point I'd like to make is I think we're really at the stage where all of the so-called big data and AI that we see in healthcare today, my argument, and I'm saying this as a data science guy, is that we're all building mechanical horses to pull a carriage. And what do I mean by that is that we have really new, this cool new technology, and we've got a really old framework for how we do things and collect data. So we're building a compromised solution. So we're all patting ourselves on the back for building these mechanical horses pulling carriage, carriages. Uh, so I, I'll even say that we probably have all the algorithms we need for the next 10 years, I'm gonna say that. What we don't have is the right data to feed into these algorithms. It's a huge, huge problem. So what I've been focusing on lately at Mount Sinai is how do we get rid of the carriage, right? So, and how do we redesign care environments that generate uh, the right data uh, to feed these hungry algorithms for data-driven medicine? So this is, uh, you know, we're really focused until we have the right data and the, the, not only the scale of data, but the, you know, the structure, the right structure of the data, et cetera, we're not going to be able to make the predictions that we want to. And lastly, I'll just say, you know, one thing we really don't have data on is actual health, right? So people before they get disease, right, is a huge problem. So we all want to predict, you know, I was two, two questions that really motivate what we're doing is that, you know, what is health and what is disease? And we have really, really, really poor answers to both those questions. So, um, you know, we're really focused on how can we predict these, you know, disease transitions, you know, from health to disease if we have almost no information on health. Uh, one of the questions we're trying to ask is what if we actually had a health record, 
and, and how would we collect it and how would we engage people to collect that information? You might hear the term electronic health records, but they're just records of your diseases and your treatments, mm -hmm. right? So how would we build this health record and then use that to predict transitions to disease? So this is the, the challenge we're really focused on. So I'm going to throw out some group questions uh, for all the panelists to, to bat around a little bit. Um, and then I'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, I wanted to start out uh, by asking about, uh, about cost. Each of you in your various realms is addressing in one way or another cost and quality of care or both. Uh, but I want to zero in on cost. And I wondered if uh, you could describe how you're improving efficiency of care and how you're, how you're lowering costs with the solutions that you've put in place. Uh, maybe, uh, Ray, you could start us out with that one, uh, with the home-based care model you've... So really, the, the big winner of the telemedicine, at least in our care model, are patients. So we timed patients uh, from the time they left their home to the time they returned the home after seeing us for 30 minutes in clinic. And patients were spending four hours and 15 minutes for a 30-minute uh, clinic appointment. Uh, uh, and just regular care, and they have to do this every three or six months for the next 15 years of their life. Um, so we've eliminated that uh, almost altogether. Uh, we see them uh, directly in their homes. Uh, they don't need, uh, one person, the first person I ever saw was upset because he had to ask his wife to take off time from her volunteer job uh, to take him to the doctors, and she, he always felt guilty about that. So the big winner uh, for us is uh, not so much us, uh, but really the patients that we serve. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan, you maybe you want to talk a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think ours is, is you know, pretty clear. I mean, I think, um, you know, the basket of, of uh, generic drugs we expect to make, we expect to take the market price down by more than 50%. I think the, um, the interesting thing, the hidden costs of this shortage issue with, with hospitals is really in... Uh, it's, it's really in the amount of time and stress it takes to go track down an essential medication. Um, if you think about it, if you don't have a particular drug, what that means is that you've got to pull all your staff together and the pharmacist's got to train them on, a, on an alternate uh, therapy. And that happens all the time. And so, um, in fact, we talked to one major health system who literally has somebody every day sit, hit F5 every couple of minutes on their, that's their job, to refresh their ordering screens from their wholesalers to see, to watch for product to become available so they can buy all they can of it. Um, it's just really inefficient and in creating a lot of drag on, on our healthcare system. So, you know, uh, not only can we take the price down, we think we can, we can solve a lot of the kind of the operational drag that it's causing. Yeah, how much are shortages uh, costing on an annual basis? You know, uh, it, it's hard to estimate, you know, but it, one of the interesting things, it's hard to estimate the amount of time and stress that goes into it. Um, hmm. We're, of course, primarily interested in the impact on patient care, and it really does impact patient care. Um, for example, if we don't have the right rotation of broad-spectrum antibiotics and several of them going in and out of shortage all the time, our mortality rate for hospital inquired infections, we, we go from a 90% survivability to a 40% survivability. Mm. So we don't have those drugs to rotate in, six in 10 people die when they get a hospital acquired infection. So there's, there's that impact, which is our primary concern. And so when, but then it's all hands on deck and it's literally everybody calling people up saying, hey, can you spare a vial of this? Um, uh, and that is not the way it should be for drugs that are, are essentially small molecule, have been around literally for decades, and that's, those are the issues we're, we're addressing. And Andrea, I'm sure you have a cost story to tell. Uh, I have a few. So, you know, first of all, I'm so impressed by all the panelists and all the work that's being done, and it's very important that we find a way to curb cost and to save money. But 60% of Americans have chronic disease and are taking chronic medications. That's before an acute illness hits them. What I think we need to do to curb cost is to move upstream. I never want to see patients in the hospital, right? We're getting rid of hospitals. I don't want to see them in the ICU. You know, I'm an optimist. I believe people really want to be healthy and they want to do right for themselves. So I think it's time that we changed what we're doing in healthcare and moved healthcare to people that, and everyone has to really, except for maybe a few percent that don't want to ever be involved in their own healthcare, just like the paternalistic approach. 
but really people have to drive their own health care and, and they have to know what they can do to become healthy. And that's where our job is changing. We have to share the information and share risks with them and teach them about their environments and what they could do lifestyle wise and how they can prevent chronic diseases. We know and as at Geisinger, we look at our data and we look at our cost. And we know if you're healthy, you cost us almost nothing. So not only are you happy because you're healthy, but we're happy because you're healthy. Now let's talk about a person who has one chronic disease. The per member per month cost goes up by hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You have two, three chronic diseases, we're paying thousands a month for you. We're now in trouble with you. So we want to be aligned with the patients to get them healthy. The way we see it now is, it's, I think, you know, people would agree that we have to get our communities healthy. And so with the fresh food pharmacy, with our opiate programs, with our free to be mom, with our genomics, we have different approaches to get ahead of disease, get upstream. With the fresh food pharmacy, we know we've cut costs by two thirds in our pilot patients. And our patients were chosen, they were basically volunteer, they were very sick people, costing way more than the average person with diabetes. And so we know that those numbers are very inflated, but we expect, and we've been following our trends for the last two years, and we now see that there's a 25% reduction in ED visits, a 75% reduction in hospitalizations. So the money follows the outcomes. The patients are clinically improving, the hospitalizations are going down, and the costs will follow. So we're looking to approach diseases with disease-specific approaches, but really we wanna get ahead. So we're looking to put the information in the hands of our patients, giving them the knowledge of what they should be doing preventive medicine-wise, how they can improve their lifestyles. If they have unmet social needs, transportation, food, housing issues, we step in as a health system and we help. So we find housing, we give food, we provide transportation. So we're trying to take care of those issues that affect health, that 70% of health outcomes, we're trying to affect change in the communities. And Joel, maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of how your approach to Yeah, so, so, so to follow on that is, you know, bringing this the hardcore science of precision medicine into the precision sort of health and mm. focusing on prevention and wellness, but the, and we talked about that a lot already. One of the other areas on the cost side is actually trying to get all of the health data and cost data together in one place. That sounds like it'd be easy, right? Yeah. No. So, so what we're finding, so we're, we're doing this at Mount Sinai, which is a huge, you know, I think it's a $9 billion, I think, health system. I know we have several million patients. So, uh, you know, we're, no one person at any health system knows where all the data is. They know the person you should talk to to get that data. And all these different units, these different software, and they all, so, you know, I'm on a Alice in Wonderland-like journey at one institution to try to find out where all the financial data is and how I connect it to the clinical data so we can do machine learning, predictive modeling, et cetera. And, and you know, I'm picking on Mount Sinai because that's where I am, but it's the same at any other uh, institution. Nobody knows where all the data is, and it's not all in one spot. But we, and if it was, I can guarantee you, we know there's lots of low-hanging fruit that we can use, uh, you know, predictive modeling and things on if we just all get it in one spot. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, challenges, if not the biggest challenge in, in healthcare innovation is bringing these novel solutions to scale, uh, getting buy-in from the institutions and then buy-in from uh, others that might join you in your efforts. So I wondered if you could discuss how you're approaching that problem, how you scale these changes uh, beyond the local level uh, and how you bring in you know, physicians, hospital administrators and other stakeholders to get behind these changes. Um, Dan, you've got a, a unique sort of example of this, which is underway right now. Maybe you could talk about how you've gone about that. Well, it was a two and a half year process, right? So, uh, you know, the idea, it was Martin Shkreli and Daraprim um, that bothered me. How does this happen in a market that should be competitive? And I, I don't know if you know this, but the price of Daraprim is still today $750 a bill. And why is the market not correcting itself? And um, you know, uh, internally in our mount, it was not a tough sell. I think people were saying, you know, it's great if you can get people along. But, um, you know, Governor Levitt connected me with Rick Gilfill and at Trinity, and five minutes on the phone with Rick, uh, he said, I'm in. Um, I connected with the VA and uh, Mike Valentino and his team in March of 2017, and 
got a great phone call, and they said, we're in. And so just one by one. Um, Midsummer last summer, we had five major health systems saying, hey, we're serious about this. We picked up, you know, just working the phones, picked up some people who um, spent their careers in drug manufacturing at Amgen, uh, who became advisors. One of our, our inaugural CEOs, a former chief quality officer at Amgen, you know, who's doing this without compensation. Um, it was just really kind of picking people up. And um, there's power in a good idea. And this was a good idea. And, and the fact that um, there's a lot of people who have their hand in the cookie jar, so to, so to speak, to say, look, I need to get what's mine. Um, we started this with a clear construct to say, we want to create a societal asset that nobody owns. So we organized as a Delaware non-stock nonprofit corporation. And we brought three major philanthropies to serve as governing members, not only because of the vision of what they have for healthcare, but also because we want to make it impossible to monetize Civica. I will take a unanimous vote of all the governing members to ever convert this to anything but a non-stock, non-profit corporation. And the goal is to really get that out of the way. I don't know if you saw the news a couple a month ago, September 11th, I think it was, where a, a pharmaceutical executive said he had a moral obligation to raise the price of his drug by 400% of, of an antibiotic. Because his morality was to the shareholders. And we wanted to purposely start off with a model that society is the shareholder of Civica, that our role as the board and as chairman of the board is to make sure that these essential med medications are, remain in the public domain, that they're available and affordable to everyone. And that mission is what's brought people to us. And, uh, and we've been really pleased so far with, with the response. Hey, can you talk about who some of the, the member, the participating organizations are? Yeah, so our, our governing members, our philanthropies are the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, the Gary and Mary West Foundation, the Peterson Center on Healthcare. Our uh, governing health system members are Intermountain Healthcare, SSM Health, Trinity Health, Hospital Corporation of America, Catholic Health Initiatives, Providence St. Joseph Health, and Mayo Clinic. I've heard of those. Uh, and Ray, I wondered if you could talk about how you've approached this this issue with with scaling some of the solutions to home-based care for specific types of patients. So to Andrea's point, we need to bring care to patients and not patients to care. Uh, so one of my colleagues in the Netherlands, Boss Bloom, created something called Parkinson TV, which are these educational episodes that include patients that arrange topics like diet, exercise, medications, and surgical treatments. And we filmed episodes of Parkinson TV, put it out on Facebook, and reached uh, over half a million people around the world so they can learn about uh, their Parkinson's disease, regardless of who they are, where they live. One of my students is from Mexico. He translated into Spanish. And evidently, they did binge watching in Monterey at a uh, support group in Monterey, Mexico. Um, the other flip side is there are some parts of care that really don't scale, and I don't think we want to scale. Um, so the analogy I use is I have four boys, and I don't think a lot of things at parenting scale, and I don't really think we want them to scale. <laughs> um, the best parts of teaching really uh, don't scale. And I think if we always look for scale, um, I think we just end up treating people as widgets, and you probably felt like that uh, when you go to the doctor's offices. You know, sometimes you get a number, and you get processed by receptionist, and then a medical assistant takes your blood pressure, and then you see a doc for five or 10 minutes, and then you get processed out. And if we look for efficiency and scales are driving things, then we get uh, McDonald's or something like that. And I don't think that's necessarily what we want uh, for care. So we really try to focus on what are maybe some elements of care that can be scaled, like education, but really how do we provide patient-centered, personalized care to people on their terms and not on my terms. Mm -hmm. Andrea, I wonder if you could talk to us about how you approached that sort of the initial conversation or how that took place with Fresh Food Pharmacy and, you know, sort of how you got um, that rolling and got the institutional buy-in. You've obviously had some great results, but how did that begin? So it began because I saw a need. I was volunteer. I had moved from Los Angeles to a place called Danville, Pennsylvania, which some say maybe is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my career, and I was volunteering and packing bags for children in our local school system and realized that the food that we were providing our children 
was really food I wouldn't feed my kids. And I thought, gosh, this isn't good because in medicine we say above all do no harm. And I was for sure harming these children that I was trying to help. And I thought I need to do something better or different. So I spoke with the wonderful women that had set up this program and they said, Andrew, we can't change what we're doing. We can't get refrigeration, there's no space, and the food bank sends us this food, and, and well, we spend a dollar to two dollars every backpack, so it's affordable, and that's what we're doing. I said, well, let me see what I can figure out here. So I talked with some different people, and what I quickly realized, and again, they never taught me this in medical school, but our community partners are really the heroes, right? They're doing, um, tons and tons of work and they know what people need. So I met with different community people, met with some philanthropists, and met with our local food bank and some people from Feeding America. And what we figured out was that in medicine, we know that eating healthy, say, healthy food provides health. And, um, but in the food provision business, for those that are food insecure, and one in eight adults are food insecure, one in six children, or food insecure, provide, their motto is really to close the meal gap or end hunger. And they'll do that in any which way they can. So they will provide foods that are healthy and they'll also provide foods that are not so healthy. So, um, so I created a partnership with our food bank and said, look, I'll, I'll work with you and I'm gonna prove to you that providing healthy, safe, nutritious food to people who are food insecure will improve their health. So I got buy-in from the food bank. I went to some local um, foundations and said, you know, we have this program, we'd really like to try it out. There are people, very vulnerable people in our community that need help, can you help us? And they said yes. And I spoke with some leadership at Geisinger and I happen to have the same last name as the CEO, so apparently some <laughs> people thought that maybe this was a mandate. Um, but I said, please don't think David Feinberg is having me do this. But you know, we all got together. We all got on the same team. And I literally was shopping at the local markets, packing the bags, finding a fridge to put the food in, and recruiting patients, meeting with clinics. And lo and behold, you know, within six weeks, people were doing really well. So then it's, once you have, once you're result driven and you demonstrate people get better quickly, and, and by the way, I'm a pulmonologist, I'm not an endocrinologist, so I just picked the most diet responsive disease. Within six to 12 weeks, we demonstrated improvement. At six months, we had sustained results, people losing buckets of weight, getting much healthier. Then I got buy-in. Mm. Then leadership in the health plan, in the clinical system, in uh, the philanthropy. You know, we raise lots of money, and and it's been a partnership between the health system, which I think we're going to see much more of. The health system partnering with community partners that do great work, and figuring out how we can work together to serve the needs of our people. Mm. And. Uh, Joel, talking about uh, data integration and, you know, the, the amount of data is exploding, you know, in terms of both within um, uh, medicine and uh, sources that are external to it. I wondered if you could talk about sort of how, you're, how you've gone about um, getting the institution on board with the effort to really integrate and use this data most effectively. Yeah, so, I mean, it, that's a pretty simple answer. It's always, you know, compelling use cases you know, uh, to drive uh, uh, disruption of the data. But I think, you know, one thing that's important about what we're doing is, um, so, we're, we, so we never serve the, the hospital as like data, we don't build business intelligence dashboards and things like that. We are trying to use inf data to create new products and to, to drive innovation at the health system, which is different than like IT, what they do. So we have this precision health enterprise group that I run, which I say is Google X, sort of for Mount Sinai. We only report to the CEO, and we specifically do not report to the hospital presidents because I think it's a real Henry Ford quote. So if you ask people what they want, they'll say faster horses, and, and that's exactly what hospital CEOs are like. You know, so we're thinking, what is the 10x opportunity with data that's really going to, you know, I don't want to incrementally improve your primary care. I want to shut it down with something that's better. It's like these, uh, you know, these which uh, these pop-up uh, smart precision health clinics that we're building that can be deployed into the community. So that's really how we're using data to drive innovation, new products, uh, uh, new services, things like that. 
So we're, we're in a time period right now, I think, in medicine um, uniquely where we're seeing, you know, technology and mindsets change and business models change, you know, at the same time. Uh, so I, I wondered if you could talk about, you know, the kind of uh, demand you're seeing for the changes you're pursuing, you know, how we ensure that, that these positive changes benefit all patients, you know, not just those with the best insurance uh, or the ability to buy a new gadget. Um, uh, maybe, Andrea, you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, where we provide care, we have, uh, we, we have uh, different buckets of patients, and we don't look to see what's the best way to make money from the individual type of insurance a person has. What we're looking to do is really improve value, so you know, improved outcomes and reduce costs, and we look at that across the board. And so anything we can do in that regard, we consider a win. So um, I would say we're looking to innovation, to innovate in those areas and to come up with new payer models and value-based approaches and assuming more risk and, and trying to reduce cost and improve outcomes. And Ray, can you talk about, about how you're making sure that, that the things you're putting in place at Rochester are, are reaching all the people you want it to reach? So there's a real concern that these technologies uh, and something called the digital divide, differential access to the internet based on social, geographic, and economic factors can actually make disparities worse. Uh, um, Jared and I did a study with smartphones, and I'm sure the users of our smartphones were overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly well-educated, and higher income, but yours maybe not. No, it's not what we find at all. You did, you did, yeah, yeah. You did better than we did. Yeah. We, we've uh, struggled. Um, we've addressed the geographic uh, disparities in care. We've addressed a little bit of the economic. We've been unable so far uh, racial. Uh, some of our telemedicine studies have been like 97% white. And so we have not cracked uh, that nugget yet. I think we have to do more outreach and we need to do more uh, providing care, maybe not just directly into the home, but in clinics, because some people may not be as comfortable with these technologies and need more support uh, to do that. Uh, but we haven't cracked it. Um, we're open to suggestions. And maybe you could talk about your experience. Yeah, as a follow on that, I think it's, it's always been interesting that the, in the mobile or digital health, the knee jerk has always been, well, digital health is just going to you know, benefit people who have means and, and uh, leave people behind. But there's a, a researcher at Mount Sinai, Carol Horowitz, who has done a lot of research into underserved communities. And if you don't know where Mount Sinai is, we're on the Upper East Side, 99th and Madison. We're literally on the fault line of one of the, between the, one of the richest and poorest zip codes. Uh, Upper East Side has been the wealthy side, and then Harlem, uh, East Harlem being on our, our north side. Um, but what we've, they've shown is that actually the, the, the underserved populations in Harlem are much more likely to engage in their mobile phone. And they, what the short answer is, is because it's their only connection to anything, basically, you know, so that, you know, they don't have a clinic or something that, you know, they trust and can walk into, so they're more likely to engage. But, but trust me, everybody's got smartphones because they're practically free, mm -hmm. some of the Android phones, right? So. Um, so we find that, you know, that there's much more engagement and satisfaction. So each of you is challenging the, the status quo in healthcare in one way or another. You know, it's a heavily regulated industry. Uh, status quo is often uh, guarded by existing stakeholders or government rules. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the barriers that you're encountering um, in regulation or finance or private industry and, and how you're... Um, how you're addressing those to see the type and pace of change you'd like. Uh, Dan, I'm sure you're uh, dealing with this issue as we speak. Well, <clears throat> you know, I served in the Utah State Senate. I saw up close, there's a lot of money that, gets, that flows through um, the debates around um, healthcare spending and pharmaceuticals in particular. Um, what we like about the Civica model is we designed it, we just assumed that pathway would be close to us. And um, so we designed a model that um, is essentially what Civica is designed to do is to be a private, societally owned check on the abuses in the generic drug market. Um, and um, we don't. We were in last week. We were briefing um, Senate and House staffers here in Washington, and basically we don't need anything from them. We said, look, just apply the same rules you apply to everybody else, to us, and that's all we need. 
And uh, we're not looking to Washington to solve this issue. We think it's an issue that we can collectively solve as, as hospitals. Um, part of that is really practical. Um, again, there's a lot of money that flows into this space. I will say this, that we've been really pleased with um, the response we've had uh, from, from regulators um, and from the, the administration on both sides of the aisle. People have been interested in helping them. We had a really terrific call with the FDA um, about a month ago, walked them through with what we're doing, and, um, and you know, basically the response is, what, what can we do to help you? Uh, we are, but we're not looking for special favors. We think this is, um, we, what we like about this idea is it is a private market, a, a market solution to a problem that exists. And um, what I think you're gonna see is more and more um, atypical new business models that that will develop to say, look, if nobody, our, our realization at Intermountain said, if we don't do this, if we don't try to lead this, nobody will be able to solve this problem. And um, <clears throat> there's a social justice component to us, to this effort for us. It, it, it's offensive to me personally to have these drugs that, um, that have been developed through the innovation engines of this, of this country that we've paid a very, um, high price for in many instances through the patent protection period to have those drugs when they become part of the public domain and those formulas are essentially owned by the public to have people corner those markets and exploit patients. And um, so there was very much that flavor. For me personally, I was offended by it. And I think um, that drove some of the organization we're seeing around Silica. Well, I wonder how you deal with some of those. And I wonder if you've encountered barriers from the companies that already have those captive markets and monopolies and barriers. I mean, the concern about them, you know, dropping the price on something you're trying to introduce. Well, sure. I mean, that, that look, a typical monopoly would, um, look, you only have one power company in your neighborhood for a reason. Because there's inelastic demand, high fixed cost of entry, meaning you got to dig up every, if a competitor was coming in, they'd have to dig up every street and lay down the same fiber and very low marginal cost of production. And that's the you know, epitome of a natural monopoly. You have a first mover advantage, you have your stake in the ground. Private capital does not flow to those markets to bring competition in because the incumbent player can collapse the price to their marginal cost, wait you out, blow through your capital and raise it up later. That happens all the time. What we realize, though, is that Intermountain Healthcare is going to be buying these drugs for 50 more years. And that if we got together with the other people who are actually buying the market, who are the market, that we could do this differently. And we, we are pre-contracting with every hospital system who joins with us as members on a take-or-pay contract that they are going to buy Civica drugs um, at a set price that is fully transparent with only enough margin for Civica to recover to stay in business, and that's it. And then hopefully socialize the rest of the gains to the broader society. Um, that's the only way to do it. And so it's essentially a collective vertical integration play through a public utility, socially owned public utility model. And we think it'll work. And Ray, I had a slight variation on this theme for you. I wondered, you know, your thoughts on, I guess, how you encounter maybe barriers in the payment system, how you work with those to ensure that these services are reimbursed and that the models you're pursuing are sustainable. So, yeah, so briefly, if someone with Parkinson's disease comes to see me at the University of Rochester in a hospital-based clinic, Medicare pays me about $200 for an outpatient visit. If I see them in their community, it's about $100. If I see them in their home via telemedicine, it's $0. Uh, so it's a huge issue. Um, and so people have been paying into Medicare for the last 50 years, so it's the purpose to guarantee access to health care when they need it, when they're older and they need it. And 40% of Medicare beneficiaries with a neurological disorder don't see a neurologist. It's the only way this changes is through will and political will of those who are most directly affected. It's all the ones whose hands went up. Uh, you guys should be saying uh, to Medicare and to your congressmen and women uh, that you know Medicare should cover uh, care provided in the home via telemedicine, and it's cheap. Andrea, your thoughts on? So the difficulties we run into is that it seems so obvious to approach lifestyle diseases by lifestyle education and provision of of goods 
if goods are in low supply for certain populations. Legislators love the idea. Both I of both, right and left, understand the importance of it. But there are existing rules and regs that say you can't entice patients into your health plan if you give them over $75 worth of goods a year. So we're talking about pens and backpacks, but what we think about is the cost of food, right? Nobody stops you from writing a prescription for metformin or insulin this past month was $900. Oh my goodness, how crazy is that for somebody on a fixed income to have to pay that amount of money for just one medicine? So what we think is that we are going to keep doing what we're doing. We prescribe the food as medicine, so it's a medically directed food pantry. So we're, we, our lawyers <laughs> said that was fine. <laughs> but the fact is that healthcare is going to have to change where Medicare this year, CMS is um, approving the provision of food. But what they're saying is you can't decide who you're going to give to based on social need. You got to give it to everybody. Well, that makes zero sense. To bring up parenting, I didn't do for my son what I needed to do for my daughter. So, and what I did for my daughter, you know, she's a wonderful young woman and she, we gave her the love she needed. And for my son, I gave him the love that he needed, right? So for different patients, they have different needs. We don't need to do the same for everybody. So, you know, the folks that make the rules and regs will have to understand that social need is as important or more important than having an actual ICD-10 code that's billable. So we have challenges. Part of my responsibility, I believe, is to meet with legislators all the time just to share what we're learning as we go, and also then to bug them to change the laws, to give money, and, and eventually, you know, we need our payers to pay for things that they're not used to paying for. And maybe that means they shouldn't be paying for other things. That's their choice and their decision process. But we feel that it's part of our job to help with the education. And I did hear somebody, I, I'm in a mess, it was Bruce Gipsty, I, I can't recall exactly who said it, but they said healthcare isn't going to be decided in Washington. It's going to be decided with companies in Delaware that are going to really pave the way. and in New York and so forth. And so we think we need to do our work and then share it and get things to change. And Joel, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, how the data rules you know, need to change, how, how we incentivize the level of sharing yeah. that you're talking about needing in order to feed the algorithms. And, and yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Data liquidity, patient data liquidity is, is, a, is something that needs to happen and it's not happening. What's really unusual about it is that the laws are actually in place such that patients do have right to their own data, right? And sort of, a, but you know, the, the, the details on the implementation are sort of left to interpretation, right? So you, you might know that I can go to any health system and request my data, I have a right to it, but they could print it out and give me a big folder this big and they would have satisfied that requirement. They could burn it to a CD-ROM, right? They could do whatever they want to, to satisfy that requirement. So. You know, and there's a, the electronic health record systems that are in place will have a big role, I think, to play in this, but they've been uh, sort of resistant to embracing things that would open up the data, you know, the EPICs, the Cerners. Uh, there is a protocol that's going to open up the EHRs called FHIR, F-H-I-R, that's being put into place, but it wasn't, in my opinion, is it wasn't until Apple got involved, someone with the weight of Apple, to start beating up on the Epics and the Cerners, that they got serious about implementing Fire because obviously Apple wants to leverage Fire for their care kit and health kit to help patients access their own medical records. So ironically enough, it was actually, uh, or not ironically, it was Apple throwing their weight around that's really pushed this, this whole field forward. I wondered your perspective on how Research Kit is changing things in terms of the, the speed with which you're able to pursue research, but then the challenge of, yeah. of you know, retention. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we were just talking about this. So, you know, we've, and uh, some other folks up here have had experience running uh, trials through, through Research Kit. If you're not familiar with Research Kit, it's a software layer that's built into iOS that lets you conduct sort of remote uh, clinical trials in a, in a digital, uh, secure digital way. Uh, we, did, we conducted an asthma health study uh, across you know, 40 different states, tens of thousands of people enrolled. I mean, if you look at a traditional clinical trial, these numbers are 
astounding. And there's all kinds of really neat things we learn at this large population level. Uh, but one of my favorite findings, which is ironic because I'm a very optimistic person, <laughs> is that uh, the attrition rate is very, very high, even in, even in these digital studies, right? So sort of, and it, this actually shouldn't be surprising because compliance with anything in healthcare seems to still be a major <laughs> problem. So it just turns out that even in patients with disease, uh, chronic disease are not as motivated to continually to supply uh, information for these studies, right? So this is a challenge we don't have the answer to. Uh, necessarily, but I do think it's going to come from engaging with, you know, Apple and some of the other sort of consumer companies that do seem to be good at getting people to comply <laughs> with certain behaviors. So, so uh, we have about five minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, if uh, you could just go ahead and introduce yourself, let us know who you are, where you're coming from. Why don't you go ahead? A little microphone's coming to you so everybody can hear. Thanks. Um, is it on? Hello? Okay. Yep. Um, so you were talking a lot about the um, benefit to the patients for telemedicine. But my question is, there is a clear financial incentive to the healthcare institutions as well. They can see more patients in a shorter period of time. So what are the, I mean, has, it, has the analysis been done uh, to show the benefit uh, to the health system alongside uh, the benefit to the patient? And what are the other technologies that can be given to the patient to be put in their homes in order to improve their longer-term care beyond a single approach to one disease and to be uh, you know, larger towards wellness? So the limited coverage of telemedicine is obviously limiting uh, medical centers from adopting it, but they do adopt it um, yeah. for some things. It increases their reach without them having to build hospitals and parking lots and clinics. So there's substantial cost savings uh, there. And then there'll be in the future, you know, peripherals. Uh, Jared doing a lot of stuff with uh, uh, passive monitoring of people in their home. So you can imagine for Parkinson's disease, you can monitor somebody's gait and see if they're walking more or less and probably or faster or slower and give you a good sense of how they're doing with it. And so you can mm -hmm. go on and on with lots of tools. Another question? The microphones. Sorry, you're over in the corner, but there you go. Thank you. My name is Tzvi Marom. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Israeli High Tech Association, and we have some programs the, like the ones that you discussed, but have you been thinking that maybe the scope of your programs should not be just the United States, but out, out of the United States, and that m might lower the costs dramatically. Um, for example, we have uh, a program, Mama is the Doctor, which is exactly health by food and so on and so on. And so the community of diabetics is, for example, is not only in the United States. Obesity is a general world problem. And there is a responsibility starting with the industrial food that is made by the likes of McDonald's and going on that people are looking to the US for innovation or at least for a leadership. So have you been thinking about expanding the programs out of the size, out of the, of the realm of the United States? Food pharmacy goes international. Yeah, so yes, <laughs> we would love that. I would say the last two years we've been learning and reiterating and we feel very comfortable with the program as it is now. We're looking to scale with a national partner and the world's our stage, I guess, from what I'm hearing. So we would love to, to do that. I think it, it, we're not just focusing on diabetes. I think we really, you know, the entire world actually is becoming less and less healthy. And that's because we're not doing the activities that our grandparents did. We um, lead more sedentary lives. Our food sources are different. And our approach to fast foods is different, right? So, um, so I think that what we need in the fresh food pharmacy is really to perfect or figure out how we can um, transmit the knowledge of lifestyle medicine and then take the show on the road. So I agree, um, you know, we just haven't fig figured out exactly how. And, and with all due respect to our tech partners, I don't think that this is a tech solution, 
because there are lots of apps out there that help people to meditate and lose weight and exercise. And I love them and I live by them. But, um, but I think that this, we have to do this with people. And so we have to figure out how to do that. And we just haven't figured that out yet. I'm going to fast follow on that. So I'm actually about to sign a partnership with Hassel Plotner Institute and Potsdam to do this type of thing. But one thing that's interesting that's happening in Europe is that it's getting very hard to get access to the data <laughs> because of the privacy laws. So actually the, the benefit for Hassel Plotner is actually being able to get access to data in the United States because it's very hard to get access to data in Germany. So it's a, a challenge there at least. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one last question. From over there. Uh, right behind you there. Hi, I was curious about Civica. I think it's a great idea. I was wondering, do you have to worry about antitrust challenges the way you're constructing it? You know, no, we've had um, antitrust counsel review this over and over. Nothing prevents a market from uh, groups of customers coming and say, look, we're going to choose to contract with this customer. Uh, it's particularly fun in that we're only going to compete in markets where there's already a dominant player and the market's not functioning. So those are the markets we're purposely trying to enter. Um, so it's a, we feel pretty comfortable that we're on solid ground. Well, this has been a great discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, round of applause for the panelists. <laughs>